So, hi everybody. Um, my name is George Carter. Uh, I run data stuff at the RAF. Um, and I'm going to talk to you a bit today about some of the lessons we've learned as we've implemented data mesh. So what I'm hoping is that you guys uh, have soaked up loads of the good data mesh learning already. Uh, I'm not going to massively recap that. What I am going to talk about is some of the hills we've hit, some of the hurdles we've faced, uh, and, and some of the approaches that we've taken to overcome those. Um, so I guess I'll start with a little bit about me. Uh, so I lead all things data at the RAF headquarters. Um, what does that mean? I guide the development of data things, AI things, analytics things. Um, uh, basically, if it smells like data, it somehow lands on my desk. Um, so uh, increasingly, that's looking like how we do API management for software as well. Um, and also, uh, a stone that I have not yet unturned is uh, modeling and simulation, which I think is uh, also going to eventually um, hit my desk. Uh, so when I say like yeah, to to lead those things, what does that what does that mean? Um, I'm responsible for setting the strategy at the RAF. So how's the RAF going to um, make better use of data? How's it going to change? How's it going to grow? Um, I also run the transformation program, and I, that's the bit that I'll kind of major on today. What is that transformation program? How does it look? And that's the place where we've really learned some of the lessons that I wanted to share with you. Um, I also have to look, I have to have an eye on how the entire Air Force gets upskilled um, on data, whether that's data practitioners or whether that's senior commanders that need to do something with data that they receive. They can stop arguing about ones and twos and start going, what are we going to do to make the changes in the Air Force based on the data that we're seeing? So, um, and then I also guide for some of the more strategic projects, guide the delivery and implementation of those. Um, Clearly, I don't do that alone. Uh, so we have a couple of partners um, in the room and a couple of partners out there. So working closely with a company called Contino, um, who are providing excellent support to us in the RAF. Uh, also working with Starburst, um, Immuta, and a few others coming down the line. Um, my remit covers the entire Air Force because it's in the, the headquarters function. So um, yeah, small job. Um, so things I'll talk to you about, I'll give you a little bit of an overview of the RAF's transformation agenda. I'll talk to you about what that looks like um, and why we've made some of the choices we've made. Um, and then talk to you about the lessons that we've learned as we've gone through the first, I've called it, it's the first year in Data Mesh. Uh, that's probably a bit generous. It's probably been more like six months. Um, uh, and then I'll talk to you about where we're going next, how we're, how we're um, building, what we're looking to do, uh, who we're looking to work with. Um, and I should, if I don't waffle too much, uh, have some time at the end for Q&A. Um, so let's start with the transformation agenda. Um, I'm going to state the bleeding obvious and say the RAF is big and complex. Uh, and uh, you're talking about an organization here that can, you know, at one end is taking the helicopter blades off a Chinook, putting it in the back of another plane, and flying it out to a place where they're going to reassemble it. Uh, or shooting the bad guys or right flying intelligence missions, you know, clearly a major part of what the Air Force does, but the Air Force also is a business. Uh, you know, we also um, have the HR functions, the capability acquisition functions, the, the media and comms functions, the strategy and plans and uh, engagement functions that every kind of major organization does. So, so when I talk about, you know, how do we do data differently, uh, that's a big breadth of different people needing massively different things. Um, and then the next point, which I want to talk about um, a little bit, is data in the RAF has never been strategically coordinated. I don't want you to leave you with the impression that you know the defense of the skies of Britain um, is uncoordinated. We are doing lots of good good stuff. We are doing, uh, in fact, loads of brilliant stuff. We work with suppliers really well. Uh, you know, there's lots of pockets of excellence. And there's, like every organization, some pockets of less than excellence. Um, one of the hardest things about my job is that the RAF is really good at making sure that we go fly operations. Uh, in fact, that's basically never compromised because people will work 23 hour days if they have to, to get the planes in the sky to do the stuff that we're going to do. And so when you talk about hey guys, I think we might want to strategically coordinate how we do data. If for a few years, uh, it's changing now, for a few years the response was, but we're doing operations so well. 
why would we need to change? Uh, and so that's a really hard thing to, to overcome. Um, and so, uh, but like what's really important is the places where we're maybe missing some value. So we've got these pockets of great stuff, but the place where we're missing some value is probably like between areas. So we've bought an aircraft A that comes with system A. Uh, and we're operating fantastically over here and we've bought aircraft B and that comes with system B and that's operating really well over here but actually they both do planning in the same way they both go we've got to get a plane in the sky that's going to need some fuel that's going to need some steps that's going to need um, some clearances to fly where we need to fly that's going to need some kind of military aviation authority engagement etc etc and so those those things where we're going between across those system boundaries uh, that's where I think we're missing a trick and that's the bit that I'm trying to trying to change um, and so the project Wyvern which as I say is the kind of major part of my job um, it, that is the transformation journey um, to deliver an enterprise approach for data in the IS. Um, so beginning this, it's like, we have this, we need to do something strategically. We got agreement from all the senior commanders in the RAF that yes, we needed to do something to change how we manage data at a strategic level in the RAF. So, uh, you know, great, thumbs up, we've got the buy-in. Uh, the question now is how we do that. Um, and I've left the headings on the bottom, so no guesses which one of these three things I'm going to advocate for. Um, the first, though, is, is tight control, i.e. an approach where we go, data doesn't happen unless it happens through us. Uh, so one approach to, to changing that is that we could have stood up a big central team. Um, the problem with that is that they would have a low understanding, and I'm going to talk about it in terms of the RAF, but this is true for any business, right? Like, they're going to have a low understanding of how the bits of the RAF operate. Their job is going to be data, not working with the business. Um, the other thing that I think would suffer if we took that approach is that leaders would be less interested. So how do you go, you know, we've got this giant data team, they can solve stuff for you, and they go, great, I've got a problem now. And you go, okay, you have to wait a little bit of time before we get to that. They immediately become disillusioned with, that team doesn't work to my agenda. Um, the other thing is that that team cannot help but become a bottleneck. Uh, you know, even if you had all the data scientists in Britain in that team, you'd miss there would be some user research, some business analysis, some sheer capacity to manage a number that, of the scale that we might need um, that, would, that would eventually become a bottleneck. Uh, but like on the plus side, the work would be highly prioritized. We would be going, let's do the thing that's most valuable first and let's work our way down that. Like That's an easy thing to do with one team. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, which is a little bit maybe where we are now, um, although not quite as bad as I've painted here. Um, you know, teams have uh, low access to skills, they have low access to tools, that's not, they, they don't have the, um, the technology with which to do stuff with data, they, and if they did, they wouldn't know what to do with it. Um, the consequence of that is the data work is of a variable quality. You know, some people are doing great stuff with the tools they've got, they're, they're achieving great things, like we see pockets of excellence, as I say, some of it's trash. Uh, not in the RAF though. Uh, <laughs> so, um, the other thing is that, like, uh, the prioritization in that area, uh, you know, the, uh, resource lies where it falls. So the people that are prioritizing their own work, of course, might not actually be the most important thing for the organization because we're just leaving them to crack on. Um, and that major thing that I talked about earlier, those cross-area opportunities are left unidentified. And so the approach we decided on was the middle ground of that, which is we still want to decentralize to some way. We still want to, you know, um, hand control to those teams. We want to do that in a way that we're giving them the skills, we're giving them the tools that they need to do the stuff that they need to do. We are worried about, in the central team, consistent quality um, and providing a service that people can use and re request help if they need to. Um, but also in that way, both we can choose who we support first, um, so we get a prioritization at a big handfuls level, and we can introduce techniques uh, like your basic agile project management techniques, which allow them to prioritize the things that are most valuable. So middle box is, is where we're at, and that was the bit that was decided you know, six to 12 months ago. Um, and we came up with some principles to support that. Um, the first is, 
domains are in control of their data organization. We don't want to wade in and tell them what they should be doing, for who they should be doing. We want to help them out, sure, with skills and tools and, and the things that they need to be successful, but we, we don't want to take control away from them. Um, that, ex that includes security. I don't mean that they're allowed to choose the security of their systems. Uh, you know, we're a government entity, we're a defensive entity. We, we need to control security to a level. Uh, but in terms of who should access data, who's, who has the right to see this information, under what circumstances, you want the people data p team to be skilled in, the, in what you know, personal data should be shared, under what context, because uh, they should be the ones with the, the expertise on things like GDPR or the Data Protection uh, Act. Um, so uh, the second principle is that there's a single point of access to data in the RAF. Um, like this is uh, maybe as stated a little unmeshy. Uh, I don't mean that there's going to be one silo of data. Um, in the RAF, what I mean is like if you need to get data in the RAF, what you do is you you go to one place and you can find the team you need. You can find the person you need to speak to. It doesn't rely on you having a friendship because your last tour was with Sergeant Bloggs and you know he's now working in the engineering team. Um, there's a second hidden point to that middle point which I always bring up and probably should add it as a fourth principle. Um, and I'll bring it up now, which will become uh, relevant in a sec. Uh, and that point is, um, you know, if we want to make sure that there's a single place to go and see data in the RAF, we also, it's incumbent upon us and the central team to make sure that that's not horrible. Um, you know, we have to keep that tidy, pretty, I'm sure there are technical words for the things I'm saying, but like that's the, that's the thing that I'm really keen to, to ensure is if they're going to do that single point, it needs to be usable. Um, and the last thing is data as a manager as a product. So uh, we're concentrating on the areas that, ha that need value. Um, we're concentrating on getting the users what they need and consumption is the measure of success, not um, you know, uh, creating it to lock it away. And, and you know, that's a, a quote from Jamek, which she gave this morning. I uh, hope you guys got to that talk, uh, but also in the book. You know, we should move beyond this concept of data as an asset to be stored in the bank and then move towards this, this place where data is a product that can be used and exploited uh, for gain. Um, and the thing I just wanted to quickly do is, like, I think I'd read the Martin Fowler article that maybe some of you guys have read as well uh, before I came up with these principles, but it was definitely a subconscious link. I didn't nick those from the Data Mesh book. So comforting that when we look at the Data Mesh book, uh, you know, we have very similar principles. In fact, those things map. Uh, and the, the point I made under the middle point, I think, is what we're talking about as federated computational governance. Um, cool. So um, before I embark on the lessons that we've learned while we've been trying to implement something that follows those principles, uh, I just want to give you a flavor of what the journey looks like for us. So we are making data teams which support functions of our organization, whether that's flying air mobility missions or delivering engineering and logistics. Um, so we're making these individual teams, we are equipping them with the tools and the skills that they need, but typically these, like the RAF hasn't recruited for out and out data professionals. We have a wide band, like you join the RAF as an intelligence officer, as a, um, uh, I'm trying to think of the real name, I'm going to say trade group four and that's not going to mean anything to anyone. Um, but like as a comm specialist, uh, for instance, which is where we tend to lump digital stuff. And then you move around a bunch of comms specialist flavored jobs. Um, and what that means is you get a lot of skill in helping the RAF do the thing that it needs to do, but you don't, that's not the way to cultivate data practitioners. Um, and so what we've been doing is trying to cultivate those first data practitioners internally so that when the consultant team backs away when the contractors that we're engaging with walk away. We leave the RAF with a sustainable capability that they can continue to use. Uh, what that means, though, is we're starting from a really low skills base with those teams and growing them organically. Um, and so uh, I think I can jump into the lessons and begin with lesson one is because of that, we have to trade off the level of empowerment we give, and the mesh is all about empowering those teams to behave in the way that they think is appropriate with their data, and I'm all for it, but we have to trade that against the level of maturity that they've got. Like, that first stage of, like, um, 
of maturity is like maybe at some point we let them choose their own like we don't need to help them identify the right products to be working on because they have adopted techniques which allow them to engage with the business and develop that um, the second thing is like finding people to be in that organization like a large part of my time is spent going hey you've got a data guy in your organization data girl in your organization doing great stuff with data already can we use them uh, and like I am much more strategically placed to be able to have that conversation though I hope in time that becomes a no-brainer for the Air Force um, the third, like as they become more mature, com teams can probably advocate for the thing that they're doing a little better. So if we uh, getting that senior leadership buy-in is probably like the third stage of maturity. Um, and the fourth one is choose their own tech. Uh, now, again, I'm all for like uh, giving people freedom of choice. I'm all for right tools for right situation. And I'm not, um, you know, I don't want to undermine the mesh principles here by, by talking about like, we're just spoon feeding people technology but if i gave the teams the choice at this early stage they wouldn't know what to do with the choice they go uh i've got excel um and uh, we don't want to be there i saw a few smiles of people like oh, my organization does that um so uh I, like what i would say is if i had more space on the slide or i thought about this this line would be a lot longer you know these are early maturity things that we need to worry about and that and we overcome those pretty rapidly um and if you've got mature data teams, I think you can push through those stages a lot faster. Um, cool, lesson two. Um, agility versus structure. Uh, my nature here is to be a bit, uh, is to go, let's just start some stuff, see where the catalyst is, like let's, let's see which teams naturally form around what products, and let's cover the Air Force that way. But like, actually, I had a really good conversation with um, our new Chief Digital Information Officer fairly early on, who said, yeah, great, but how will we know we've covered the Air Force? Like, we're going to need to begin with a level of structure, which is not my natural approach. Um, uh, we're going to need to begin with a level of structure in order to make sure that we're getting to all the people that we need to get to and we're giving everyone a fair chance to be part of the journey. Um, that doesn't mean that we, do, we don't go, okay, we're gonna do everyone at the same time. What it means is we defined up front what we were gonna call a domain on the mesh um, and we've been working in those areas. I am confident that that will evolve to the picture on the left over time, but the picture on the right gives us a more sustainable starting point that like different well-defined structure um, and now having said structure is really important <laughs> I'm gonna undermine that again um, and talk about structure versus value so again in an ideal world and this won't be common to the Air Force right like you're embarking on a big transformation project you need senior stakeholder buy-in because they're giving you the cash and the people that you need to be successful if you spend all your first year just making structures that don't deliver anything they start to lose interest in your project pretty quick and so we are treading a delicate tightrope of let's establish the teams let's give them the training let's give them the skills that they need to thrive and on the other hand let's just deliver some awesome data products um, uh, and data products is where they see the value but the structure is where we get the long-term value because the teams are doing that on their own without support um, so we have had to have some showcase products and we are having to focus harder on products now in order to secure the buy-in that we need to continue doing this awesome thing in the Air Force. And then final lesson, the macro lesson here is about purism versus pragmatism, right? As like we have this great book uh, with a, a very helpful guide rail um, in the data mesh book. Um, and what I'd love to do, again, the kind of, the, my nature is to go, but this is the theory, so let's just work until we get the theory nailed. And it, it doesn't work. Um, I mean, I'm sure, again, that's not a unique thing to me, right? Like, uh, so some things that we've had to be pragmatic about uh, are the team makeup. So we wanted to, I had a kind of idea that we would go, we'll have like some analysts, some engineers, a product owner and that would be the genesis of a good team those analysts can go into data scientists down the time eventually you might need a BA a user researcher but like we can begin with an analyst an engineer and a product owner and like the very first team went we're not doing that 
uh, and uh, what they did was multi-skill everybody so that we have data practitioner product owner um, but actually that's been really valuable because they can share the workload as they see fit um, uh, again, like I think we'll grow in time to, to um, get to the like uh, perfect team structure and we'll, we'll learn as we go as to what that perfect team structure is, but um, that was one of the points where I had to let go of my purest ideal. Um, and the second is tech choices, um, both in terms of platforms um, and in terms of like exactly what technology we're working on. Uh, same, same team. Um, they uh, told me they were building an application the other day. And I said, but you're the data analytics team. And they went, yeah, great, but you've only given us a roof and we need to build the house underneath. Like if we've got no mechanism to create the data to, to be able to analyze, we are starting off on the wrong foot. And, and again, like I, in time, I think we'll move to like, we have this perfect world of the Air Force has all the software it needs and it's modern enough to connect to and, uh, and it'll be great. But in the first instance, I have to kind of swallow the like, this is my perfect tech uh, because they're right. Like we have to do the whole thing. And if the only way to do that is to build a new app, then fine, let's, let's give it a go. Um, the other, the lo another point is enthusiasm. So um, again, I talked about these domains and where we were going to put them. Like my head goes, what the Air Force really does, like what's special about the Air Force is that we operate, like well, we fly combat missions, we fly intelligence missions, we fly mobility transport missions. Like we should go to those three places first and help them. Uh, the reality is, uh, you know, one of those teams was super enthusiastic and we have begun with them, but the other two weren't quite ready. And so rather than force my like perfect thing and cl do the kind of uphill battle, you have to capitalize on enthusiasm. And actually there are a lot of enthusiastic places in the Air Force that want to be part of this journey early. The others will become convinced in time. I don't need to spend my time convincing the things that are the people that I think are perfect. And also, lo and behold, there's quite a lot of value in those areas that are enthusiastic. Like there's lots we can go after there and still achieve the kind of things we want to achieve. Um, and then my last point, which like I'm still not over, um, which is embracing Excel. Like uh, it's a it's a tough. The business has used it for years. Like it's been a very useful tool. Uh, the thing I love and hate about Excel is that it's a database. It's an app. It's uh, analytics software. Uh, some people would say you could do machine learning in Excel, um, but I'm not uh, sure I'm in that camp. <laughs> um, so uh, like uh, you know it's used arbitrarily to um, to different ends in the Air Force and we have to work with that and we have to em embrace that um, so uh, they're the they're the four lessons I wanted to bring out uh, and I'll finish on you know where are we going now uh, and um, one of my partners asked me before this uh, he said I hope this uh, presentation is littered with pictures of planes. Uh, this is the only one, I'm afraid. Um, and even that's a Navy picture because it's being pushed off the end of a carrier, but we'll forget that. Um, speed, uh, so we are building more domain teams. We've started with a couple. We are getting around to the rest of the organization while making sure we deliver these excellent products. Like That's where our journey is focused. Um, there is obviously a lot more to that in terms of providing the sustainable platform that's the that gives the kind of self-service in infrastructure the federated governance parts but um, in general we're progressing the teams and equipping them and enabling them and that's that's where I'm focusing my energy um, that means we need more people so shameless plug here like if you want a career in the Air Force there's probably some opportunities coming down the line um, it's awesome um, it also means we need more technology. So if you're a technology provider that goes, hey, I think we ha hit a sweet spot here. You know, we'd love to chat. We're early in our journey um, uh, and we're embracing that. Like it, it, there are a lot of people with a lot of diverse needs in the Air Force uh, and it's easy to focus on analytics, which is where we've been so far. But we also have the problem of like a jet, which is only using a like five kilobit pipe to send something back because it doesn't want to be detected. Uh, like and we have to get data somehow to and from that that aircraft you know like that's a whole raft of again one of those stones that i haven't 
unturned myself. Uh, there are plenty of people that are worrying about that problem in the Air Force, again, just to reassure you <laughs> that we're safe, we're safe. Um, the, um, but, but there's plenty of tech that we need that we haven't even thought about yet is the point I'm trying to get across. So keen for the engagement. Um, and finally, like, we just have to do this really fast. Like, we have to do, uh, you know, in order to get value here, we are going a million miles an hour. Um, we're learning as we go quite a lot of the time. Uh, and that's where, where I'm personally focused on is, like, how do we get the Air Force the value that they need from data? How do we transform them into a data-rich place where there aren't people left behind? Which means we have massive scale and massive value to realize over the next two to three years. Um, and that is me. Um, come grab me afterwards if you want to um, want to chat or want to get my email address uh, for a future conversation. I'd love to talk. Um, but uh, oh yeah, I said I'd summarise. Uh, so what? Well, I talked to you a little bit about RAF data transformation. Um, uh, like the lessons uh, that we talked about were the empowerment versus maturity, the structure versus agility, um, and then that structure delivering the structure versus delivering the value. Um, and then the final one was being pragmatic in order to like, concentrate on the value. That's the important bit, not exactly what tech, exactly what person's using. Um, and I think I have time for some questions, possibly five minutes. Look at that. Uh, hey, thank you. For the, it was great presentation. Uh, I just have a question. You said that you are letting your teams choose the tooling that they are using. So first of all, what was the reason for this decision? And second of all, how the DevOps, MLOps, all the other ops things are organized? Also monitoring, you know, alerting, all yeah. the not so fun stuff around <laughs> data. So. Um like uh, the initial answer to that is uh you know right now um we are we are encouraging a particular platform we're saying like this is the one this is the one that we'll support like uh however uh, like it's about that complex needs of teams and that i couldn't hope from the central data service to be able to meet everyone's the whole air force's complex needs and so where a team identifies a piece of technology that they want to be using or should be using my initial approach would be to roll that into the service that i offer and then i can provide the devops mlops like all the the wrap um but really it's about like me not pretending to understand exactly what a combat air pilot needs in terms of data and exactly how he's going to get it does that answer your question yes yeah. Uh, thanks for the great overview. One question I had was, you mentioned you had the RF, RIF principles and you had the data mesh principles. Uh, were you saying then that those principles were based off the data mesh principles or would you argue that you're kind of making your own partial data mesh from that? Because you have your very specific requirements, but yet the four principles are very kind of in place about what they are. Yeah, so like, I think uh, I, I think I'd like, uh, so I came up with those separately because I decided that we were going to follow the empowerment route more than anything. And then I went, okay, what does good empowerment look like? Uh, but then, uh, and as I said, I think by that time, the Martin Fowler article uh, had been published. So it's not as if I wasn't influenced by the data mesh concept. Uh, I'm not claiming to have re reinvented data mesh. Uh, what I'm saying is like, uh, I think I'd already, like there was some decision about that being the right way to go for the RAF. And then like, it, because of like such a close tie with the data mesh principles, actually that's a really massive enabler for us uh, because we have a whole bank of theory now which we can draw from. Okay, cool. Hi, um, I understand your journey is not is about a year ago, you started about a year ago, but have you already identified any mistakes or things you would have done differently if you can go back a year ago? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I think one of the mistakes I made was uh, like in my communication of what we were doing actually. So um, uh, 
what I'd been saying was we're going to establish these things called domains we're gonna like a domain is a group of people aligned around a common mission those people with a common mission we're going to equip them with the tools to go do the data stuff that supports their mission uh and like in that description like you could see a senior commander's eyes glaze over and so they were going what are you actually doing and then they go can you make me a power bi dashboard uh and and so like I've that probably like the early failure of communication I think is a blessing and a curse like uh, but I think um, you know if I'd do I rewind the clock I'd say what I say now which is we're making teams in the organization aligned with the business uh, and they're going to do some data stuff like I think uh, uh, there was a kind of uh, it was I didn't get buy-in trying to talk about things which I understood as the concepts I had to talk in their language uh, and I think that's all the time we have but yeah glad to chat to anyone later